to Spell Luxury, all you need are four letters, LVMH. Since its founding in the late 80s, the French conglomerate has cultivated a roster of world-class luxury brands, from beauty to bubbly, and of course, fashion. LVMH was created in 1987, when Moet Hennessy merged with Louis Vuitton. Investor Bernard Arnold became the majority shareholder in 1989 and grew LVMH into the world's leading luxury goods conglomerate, providing much needed support to talented designers such as Christian Dior's John Galliano. John at that time was like so many of those extremely talented British designers. I mean, they have all the talent, but they don't have the business support behind them. And once you know, he had that through LVMH. I mean, there was absolutely no stopping him. Under Arnault's leadership, an impressive array of prestigious houses were brought into the LVMH fold, including Givenchy, Kenzo, Celine, Loewe, Marc Jacobs, Fendi, Bulgari, Christian Dior, and more recently, Tiffany and Company. Today, LVMH controls over 70 houses and has made an art of nurturing and marketing luxury, always highlighting each of their brand's unique heritage. Now, step into the Video Fashion Vault as we look back on milestone moments among some of LVMH's most iconic fashion houses. It's next on Video Fashion Designers. approach every show like it's the last show so I mean it, that's how it feels like to me you're only as good as your last and each one you should approach like it's your last so I certainly did this with like tons of joy and no kind of any any further thinking than getting this on the runway Vuitton, what an extravaganza. <laughs> That's Mark's last collection at Louis Vuitton. Uh, Mark Jacobs gave us a, a Victorian <laughs> farewell with a black on black set and really touching on many of the sets from past shows. You knew the minute you walked in this was totally his last show because they had the, a set that was made up of all the different sets that he's used before. So there were the escalators from a season ago and there was the carousel and the the elevators and the, the maids dusting things. I mean, sort of as a sort of a walk down memory lane for everybody who's been following him for a while. The whole spirit was very, I don't know, it was very Germanic. It was beautiful hats with feathers and everything was black and a lot of like embroidery. I don't know, I felt very honored to be a part of the show. Actually, I saw everything because I was sitting on the carousel, so I saw every outfit. It was incredible. I mean, to be honest, Louis Vuitton was completely emotional. You could see a lot of editors getting emotional about it because it was just such a beautiful show and a really fitting ending, I think, to like Mark's time at Louis Vuitton. It was glamorous, it was beautiful, it was dark, it was sensual, but at the same time, it was utterly luxurious. So it was definitely a fashion moment. Well, I mean, it's always emotional to me and it's emotional to all of us because we put our heart and soul into it. You know, that's why we do it. We love fashion. But I didn't feel it was the most emotional one. I mean, I felt it was one of the most dramatic in terms of the clothing, I think, because the clothing was actually things I think people would love to wear and would wear, will wear, and they were black. And so there's kind of that thing that you can perceive of either as glamour or as a kind of darkness or whatever, but that's all perception. We were actually looking at like Esther Williams and synch synchronated swimming. And we were going to do the whole show in white, but then we had done the carousel in white. We thought, no, we really like dark. We, and we thought of like all these characters of Paris and these muses of Paris. And, and then I just thought it would be so much chicer and so much more real. And people would really desire it and want it if it were in a color that most people I know who wear fashion wear. An entire show of black on black except for an occasional navy blue extension of a sleeve and a light blue denim that was paired underneath a lot of the very Victorian inspired tops or many of the sheer dresses that were beaded, gemmed, bedazzled, <laughs> crystallized, feathered, ruched and gathered. 
was creatively just over the top and the ability to take every adornment imaginable and bring it into beautiful embellishment. The satin ruffles, the, the plissé of the interesting fabrics, very intricate and, and playing off a lot of the Victorian ideas that we saw from his show in New York City, but giving it that reach on opulence. We always wish Mark the very best. He brings a lot of excitement to fashion, and he's certainly brought a lot of excitement to the house of Louis Vuitton, not only in the beautiful product, the interesting handbags he created, but each season, it was his Paris Spectacular, which is what we expect when we come here with over-the-top productions, and he never disappoints. He can take you somewhere really magical, and, you know, in a way, that's what the idea of travel should be about. You know, so it's not just about going some physical place, it's also going somewhere in your head and Mark can really take you there. The expectations are so high for Phoebe because she left Chloe at the peak of her career. There hasn't been a lot of new blood in Paris this season, so it's really great to have her feel like she's back, but we know that she's talented. It's got to work as a very traditional French house that's just been super updated, and I do think Phoebe's the person to do that, in part because that's the way she dresses. My first memories of Celine are really of the handbags and of the leather goods. Um, and in the past, you know, I've seen images of the kind of Celine woman, that kind of I iconic woman in a kind of 70s shirt and a 70s skirt. And I've always been attracted to, to the way it was always quite uh, practical. You know, it's never been about evening wear or cocktail or fanciness. It was always about trenches and separates and pieces that almost had a soul of menswear in a weird way. So, um, you know, the combination of the history of the leather goods mixed with that practicality just felt like it could be quite a good combination for me. Before Michael Kors, I always thought of Celine as a place that you went to get a kind of bourgeois um, shoulder bag and maybe an A-line skirt and maybe a good knit. I mean, it was very bourgeois. Excited, particularly because she's so into it, you know, she's really excited and enjoying doing what she's doing. It's not just sort of being forced to return to work, she really loves it. And, I, and we're excited for her for that reason. We're sounding really like guys, mum and dad, aren't we here? But she just seems to know what young women kind of should be wearing. such an ascension and then to leave and to walk away from it all was sort of alarming to everybody that this is her moment and so it's it's such a good feeling that she's back and back in fashion and back with such a you know important name and bringing that back I think that it's a really great moment now that she's a mom she's taken a few years off she's in many ways grown up in all sorts of ways grown up and doing a much more grown-up line I think we want to see those clothes, and we need to see those clothes because there's a lot of clothes out there that look great on the runway, but I'm not sure if people are going to wear them. Maybe the most sensible way to approach it was just not to complicate it and not to go too fashion in a way and just really, you know, everything that was in that collection came from my, uh, my gut. You know, very instinctual feeling. Well, it, personally, I thought it was riveting. The last we saw at Chloe, it was a very different style. It was more uh, feminine and uh, you wouldn't really call it girly, but it was just more about things that uh, young women were wearing. It was very contemporary feeling. This was a lot more modern looking. It was, you know, you saw these really tight fitted tops, the trench dresses. Uh, it was a totally different look. That makes sense because it's a totally different house. said to me it felt quite simple quite clean 
and that was something that I very much wanted it being a new beginning for me and for the brand and for us both working together. The chances of me getting it wrong weren't too high because it's never, you know, had a kind, it's not like taking over from an iconic designer. Um, historically, it just hasn't had that. So, in a way, it was like a, a clean palette and um, that could be reinvented, which felt very exciting. So I think there's a lot of a lot riding on this. I mean, I know, I, I hadn't wanted clothes in such a long time until I saw that resort, so I'm very excited. How has fashion changed in, in those three or four years? It hasn't. <laughs> no, it just hasn't. <laughs> it's just the same old same, to be totally honest. <laughs> it's... You know, exactly. It's, it's, it's funny to be back. It's, it's, it's the same people. It's actually quite surreal how, um, how that is. But, oh, I mean, you know, it's great, but it's, it's, it's not been a revolution. It's just a continuation of, I guess, where it was four years ago. 27-year-old British designer Alexander McQueen was appointed to the helm of the storied French house of Givenchy. Expectations were high at McQueen's debut. As most first haute couture collections, it was not, you know, 100%, and it was a little over the top, and it was very theatrical, uh, but it was beautifully done, and it had a lot of passion. Well, the sky's the limit. I loved it. I thought it was incredibly theatrical and very clever and very, very focused. But, and I think, apart from all the fancy dress, which was fun to look at, when you took all the accessories and everything else away, underneath you had the most exquisite tailoring and the most perfect draping. Alexandra, what has the best thing been about doing the Couture Collection? Working with uh, the people at the atelier and uh, Having the design executed in no way possible to man, and it comes to life. Alexander McQueen is all about a kind of hardcore sex. It's a kind of a club aesthetic of London that is in your face, blatant, provocative, scary, wounding, torturous, but that is his aesthetic. First of all, it was the, the, the logo of Givenchy, the white and gold. And then uh, I, I thought it was very Greek, so I come up with a Greek mythological feeling to it for what was the most fascinating Greek uh, story, Greek story to my, to my knowledge, um, it was Jason and the Argonauts and I thought the search for the Golden Fleece. It was quite a show, <laughs> it was definitely a show, I mean if Mr. Arnaud wanted, you know, media attention he got it and I think that Alexander is truly talented and I think if you can make the chief executive cry of the company, I think you've achieved something, make a French businessman cry. In 1999, LVMH unveiled its United States headquarters in the form of a 24-story skyscraper on New York's 57th Street. Designed by Christian de Portson Park, the elegant structure was widely praised by architecture critics. The tower's opening was celebrated with a star-studded inaugural event. It's a great honor for me to welcome you here for the inauguration of the LVMH Tower. I must say I hardly believe I'm here today with the work having started less than two years ago. Madame. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Arnaud. A few weeks ago, I was in Istanbul, and President Chirac came up to me and said, you must attend the opening of the most fantastic building. 
And I know and admire President Chirac very much, but I had no idea how accurate those words were. So it's a great honor for me to be here with all of you to celebrate this new tower and what it represents to the skyscape of New York and to the quality of our public life together. So thank you again and congratulations. In September 2016, Maria Grazia Chiodi staged her debut for Christian Dior as the house's first female designer. Dior has gone through so much. It was the first season is kind of unfair to judge Maria Grazia on because it was just kind of a resetting everything, cleaning the palette and setting it in a new direction. And it was very feminist. It was there was a very bold statement about that. I mean, of course you're going to have some trickle over from 20 years, some odd years at Valentino, especially in the evening wear, but I thought it was quite interesting that she chose to be inspired by fencers and ballet dancers, two sports that are really highly disciplined, highly skilled sports to um, really convey this power in women, and I really felt that she was trying to find a way to empower women with their clothing, and I felt like we've been talking a lot about this arrival of these female designers, and she's really been the example that everyone's turning to, and she's really taking on that debate and really proclaiming her feminism and I think that that was a really a strong statement and one that I think a lot of the women in the audience will appreciate. I thought that it was a great moment for women in fashion. You know, obviously she's the first woman to head up so grand a French couture house other than, you know, Jean Lanvin and Madeleine Vianney having their own brands, you know, almost a hundred years ago. But we're all happy that she's there and very excited to see how she evolves the look and tone of Dior. I think to begin with, you know, I, I appreciated the, you know, all of the white looks. It felt really like sort of turning the clock back to zero a little bit, a little feeling of a clean slate. And then the very, very surprising sort of return of logo mania, you know, with the bra straps and the and the straps on the shoes. You can tell, I think, that Maria Grazia got her start in accessories. She's such a great accessories designer and has a real sense for, for what's going to sell. So in a sense, I would say this collection was probably more item-y, you know, more commercially savvy than we might have thought of Dior under Raph or under John. And, you know, maybe that has something to do with the fact of being a woman again and understanding what we want and need. It was interesting what she did with the Christian Dior on the straps, with the Dior logo on the bags was very, it was different and interesting in a new direction. There were some Dior signatures, I felt like some dresses that were very 50s, the corsets were very Dior. Men designers can design beautifully for women, but I think there is something to be said for a woman designing for women. There's just that understanding, that fundamental of knowing what a woman wants. I would say a strong start. I think that she's going to lean a little bit more time to separate herself from her years of Valentino, but you know, God, her stuff at Valentino was stunning, so no problem to have a little bit of that Dior. I think it was meant to set us up for taking Dior in a whole new direction. I think people left being extremely excited to see what's to come from her. Less than a year after Kiori's debut, it was announced that the House of Dior, which the Arnault family had long owned a stake in, would officially be fully integrated into LVMH. In 1996, Princess Diana made her one and only appearance at New York's annual Met Gala. The gala celebrated the opening of the Metropolitan Museum of Arts exhibition honoring Christian Dior. For the occasion, Diana chose to wear a dress designed by John Galliano. This was a major fashion moment for Galliano, who had just been appointed head designer of the iconic French house by Bernard Arnault. I don't know, it's because she likes um, Galliano. 
a lingerie-inspired silk slip dress with black lace trim, accessorized with a statement sapphire choker, the dress would become one of Diana's most daring looks. At Kenzo, a new design team took the reins for the spring 2012 season. Umberto Leone and Carol Lim, founders of the boutique, opening ceremony. In their first collection for the Parisian label, the duo focused on bold colors, playful patterns, and youthful sophistication. We were really inspired by, I think, Kenzo's, you know, his boldness and colors and everything from, you know, the, his first collections that he started in like the 16, 69, 70. We wanted to make sure that this first line that we did really represented all those key elements of color and, um, you know, and not a shyness in color, really bold. We didn't want to design an entire collection around floral prints, so we decided to play around with little birds and flowers made from seashells. It's, I think we wanted to bring this idea that it's a, there's a naivete to it, and, a, and we wanted to have fun with it. The only way we really know how to work is very from our personal perspective and so I think when he came from Japan to Paris I think he brought a lot about what he was personal to him and what he experienced so I think for us this first collection really signifies kind of us as Americans kind of coming and, and presenting our point of view. We looked at Kenzo and we really kind of looked at what was key, I think, formulas that are that are inherently in the brand. We wanted to incorporate the idea of color and different textures into the shoes as well. And so I don't know if you could see, but the shoes are kind of made of really technical materials. net wrappings and you'll see like um, these really kind of like fun kind of like plastic tubes that you see on the jewelry and stuff and I, I think we wanted there to be an element of playfulness that wasn't yeah. so serious but it is still a great fun fashion piece and I think the shoes really were a part of that. Another surprise in store for their guests was the appearance of Chloe Sevigny, their friend and opening ceremony collaborator who closed the show in an electric blue jumpsuit. I think that we wanted to make sure that the current Kenzo uh, customer was really almost rediscovering the brand in itself and then that anybody who hadn't heard of Kenzo before would discover this in a brand new way and be as excited. With a portfolio including these iconic fashion houses as well as 70 more brands, LVMH is the largest luxury goods conglomerate in the world today. Under the leadership of Bernard Arnault, LVMH has truly harnessed the art of luxury.